Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a new edition of Africa Today. It's always Africa and Egypt is in the heart of Africa. Well, a few minutes ago there was a press conference between the uh, Foreign Minister um, Mr. Dr. Badr Abdel Ati and the uh, Foreign Minister of Niger. They tackled, of course, the bilateral ties between Egypt and Niger and how it's, uh, Egypt is always supporting the uh, country of Niger and the foundations of the diplomatic ties between the two countries. Of course, they applied and they agreed upon the uh, getting benefit of the Egyptian experience, of course, from the uh, combating terrorism. And this is the uh, collaboration uh, between Egypt and Niger. Also, there is um, a huge uh, economic uh, ties between Egypt and Niger. Um, many projects, uh, as Egypt is really existing in the um, market of Niger, um, actually supporting in the infrastructure projects, um, many banking sectors, like many other African countries. To shed more light on the um, bilateral ties between Egypt and Niger, we are delighted to have on the phone uh, our dear guest, Dr. Ahmed Mustafa, international relations expert. Dr. Ahmed, it's a great pleasure having you with us. Thank you. Thank you. It's time for me. So, Egypt is really existing in the heart of Africa. When we talk in particular about the diplomatic ties between uh, Egypt and Niger, the foundations of the diplomatic ties between the two countries, how you can describe it first of all? Uh, first of all, I think uh, Egypt and Africa is kind of uh, one of the key points of Egypt uh, in the world just to have a greater rule in Africa as it was in Africa uh, during the era of uh, our greater leader, Jamal Abdel Nasser because he gave uh, especially the liberation uh, movements in Africa like mm. uh, uh, greater weight. Uh, like so many other African countries. Of, uh, the uh, strategic mm. countries, especially yes. in uh, West Africa, uh, a Francophone country that speak French. And uh, also it has uh, some, uh, many roles uh, and some strategic uh, resources over there. Uh, the four, uh, all the powers worldwide, including Egypt, trying to have a good relation with, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, extending your ex uh, strategic impact on Africa. And also, uh, Niger also is a country that belongs to the uh, OIC, because Niger is uh, mainly a Muslim country as well. Uh, mm -hmm. The four, in this uh, regard, uh, Egypt can play uh, several uh, rules in such a uh, place because, as you know, that uh, West Africa now uh, doesn't have a proper harmony with the West, uh, especially the uh, French colonizers, and uh, uh, Egypt always started uh, to having stability in uh, the African yep. uh, continent. Yep. Uh, the four uh, the bilateral relations are crucial for both sides in this uh, regard, especially in coordination with, uh, with the new powers, especially China and Russia and the other powers. I think it will make a, a greater stability, it will uh, protect the two countries from the tourism in the future. Also, it will have like uh, a good impact on Egypt just to export because Niger is not also uh, uh, like an uh, industrial country and it's still primitive in this regard. Therefore, we can export a lot of things to Niger as a new uh, market. Uh, and also, uh, uh, the uh, Niger uh, uh, students uh, or the scholars may have like uh, programs uh, with the Egyptian University. I think uh, as have, uh, we have Education a good delegation from the Nigeria, and even uh, yeah. the Singal or Singal University here in my uh, city, Alexandria. Yeah. We have a delegation from Nigeria because we are a French speaker. Yeah. Therefore, in this regard, uh, the uh, two countries can uh, build up uh, greater bilateral relations in that respect. Yeah, so you mentioned the, the, the uh, ties between Egypt and Niger, they are supposed to be historical, uh, strong relations. Um, we talked about also the uh, educational and the cultural uh, ties, uh, they are supposed also to be strong um, through the exchanging um, educational and um, uh, trainings program. Uh, also, you talked, you mentioned the uh, political relationship and as Egypt so have been supportive for the most of the African countries to have liberation and to enjoy liberation. Uh, when we talk in particular about the trade and economic, Egypt is existing in the um, African 
continent um, basically starting from the infrastructure projects and um, energy projects. Um, how how the existing the Egyptian existence in media looks like? Uh, in look, this particular, still, uh, we we have like a roughly figure that we're supposed to reach a, a figure of 33 billion US dollars according to the uh, latest uh, statistics uh, from uh, the CAPBAS with the mm -hmm. African continent. Uh, and in this regard, we try to uh, carry out all the uh, efforts uh, that are supposed to be done with African countries. African countries, some of uh, the, you know, the Western uh, narrative saying that they are poor and they don't have infrastructure, as you said, and things like that, but we can't. It's a good opportunity because Egypt is the best portal for Africa, and Egypt also could be like, uh, you know, uh, a third party for the greater uh, powers, especially the new powers or the global south, if I talk about China or Russia or uh, Pakistan or the others, just to involve in Africa because the global south country or the new powers or the new world order not uh, intending uh, just to be like a colonizer or having like imperialism in Africa like France or Britain or uh, Germany or uh, Belgium or whatsoever. Uh, in this regard, uh, uh, Niger, it has a lot of fields that are supposed to be, uh, you know, invested. One, as you said, is the infrastructure. Second, also the academia and, uh, you know, building up, you know, universities and schools and things like that, uh, whether national or private. And the most important is the digitization, because according to the latest statistics of uh, the International uh, Communication Federation, uh, you know, the African countries, they have a lack uh, of uh, 500 uh, million, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, digital uh, identity. Yeah. And uh, these are no banking uh, services over there still over there in countries like Niger, as well as, uh, you know, infrastructure for payment uh, or fintech or things like that. And it is adding a lot of values, especially for the uh, SMEs of the startups of Egypt, not just as a giant you know, companies, and what, which will add value. If there is the proper coordination, for example, we having like, uh, you know, uh, bilateral, uh, uh, you know, meetings uh, with the ambassador, with yeah. the uh, ministers, with things like that, in order to uh, promote uh, such kind of investments or trade uh, between the two countries, to know exactly what they need, and if we have it, we can supply. If a, a party country have it, we can supply it through us or via us. Yeah. This is exactly the way that uh, whether B2B or G2G or whatsoever type of business that's supposed to be done uh, with uh, such countries. And yeah. also, as I said before, El Azhar can play a greater role in this regard as we have a proper delegation from the Niger students here studying in yeah, Cairo yes, or in Alexandria yeah. and they could be like ambassadors for us if we already focus uh, on the matter of uh, the business school or the uh, faculty of farmers that belongs to other and how to stimulate, you know, students just to open up some opportunities over there if they go back to their home country in Niger. Yeah, as you mentioned, of course, uh, Egypt is existing over there strongly through uh, opening many branch, many bank branches, uh, through um, uh, establishing the infrastructure, uh, in, in, I mean, in either in uh, the digital infrastructure or the uh, infrastructure of roads and a network of roads and transportation uh, through Arab contractors and many other uh, giant um, uh, Egyptian companies or corporations. Um, when we talk in particular about security and military file, of course, uh, most of the African countries they want to get benefit out of our experience in combating terrorism because, mm -hmm. uh, of course, because of the instability in most of them. And Egypt is really supporting most of the African countries, even till now, to, um, to get and to enjoy the uh, peace and prosperity. How, they, how Niger can get benefit out of our experience in combating terrorism, your point of view? Yeah, uh, first uh, should we know and the audience should know that Egypt always in its relation, especially with, with uh, its sisters in Africa or her sisters in Africa, based on the uh, international law according to the mutual respect and the keeping the sovereignty of uh, the African ca countries intact. Uh, accordingly, uh, you know that such kind, especially in the Western Africa, it was occurred as we heard recently and as we witnessed 
to a lot of movements of uh, fanaticism and extremism and terrorism. Uh, therefore, in this regard, Egypt, uh, of course, uh, they had uh, like a greater experience in such matters of uh, anti-terrorism and uh, things like that, as well as building up uh, the uh, base of having like a good uh, sovereign armies and training and giving uh, expertise and things like that. All of this because, you know, now uh, as we have, uh, you know, an arena for the uh, conflict, now Africa is also, despite it is one of uh, the greater uh, markets worldwide and very promising uh, continent, uh, uh, it's also a battlefield for the international conflict between, as I said before, the ex-colonizers, uh, in terms of, you know, you know, the Francophone or the Anglophone or the German or the Italians or uh, the uh, Hollandese or whatsoever, and mm -hmm. America, of course. Uh, the four, uh, you know, as the, the West, and we have a lot of proof in that, trying to uh, not to make a stability in the region, just to make such countries always belong to them. And if you talk about Niger, France, it has some malicious acts over there. And what I heard recently, even from my uh, uh, Russian uh, strategic experts, they're having some phases to uh, grow the tensions amid some uh, fanatic groups over there, and also brought some uh, Ukrainian, uh, you know, uh, nazist uh, trainers just to train them how to uh, use the tires and using drones and things like that in some French phases. And they have a lot of, you know, literature and references about this. Uh, yeah. The four France doesn't work to have a greater stability in Niger as it's supposed to be, yeah. because they feel that they are losing its uh, uh, power in, in West Africa, because uh, the dominant, it was like a Francophone dominance, as I yeah. told you before. The four Egypt can middle in such issues, uh, and they're trying to have a, a better and greater peaceful uh, dialogue, uh, in case of there is a governmental military and police and things like that, also, as I said before, giving them like training, expertise, uh, also giving them the proper uh, tools and equipment just for uh, the defense of such attacks from the, those terrorist groups or, or whatsoever in this uh, regard. Yep. Uh, and also, uh, uh, via the strong ties, even can having like impact on this and can uh, you know, reducing uh, the tensions between the separative and the fanatic groups, exactly. as well as, you yeah. know, the government and uh, the regime over there. Yeah, of course, and there are so many military maneuvers. Egypt is actually always uh, providing with, uh, with the uh, African countries and Arab countries in, in this uh, domain, I mean, to, uh, for the others to help them and to support them, enjoy peace and stability in their countries, because there is no development without peace and stability. Uh, Dr. Ahmed Mustafa, international relations expert, many thanks for being with us. Thank you, thank you. And the viewers will be back after this. Investment Initiative or the FII conference in Riyadh continued today for the second day. It's a very important um, and essential uh, conference. It's in the capital of the Saudi capital of, um, I mean, the, the capital of uh, Saudi Arabia in Riyadh. And the Prime Minister, uh, Dr. Mustafa Magbouli, is contributing and is participating in the conference on behalf of, um, Dr. of uh, President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. And he actually participated with this speech of Egypt yesterday. In the Amnesty speech, he mentioned the uh, economic reform, which is uh, Egypt uh, tackling nowadays and uh, 10 years ago. Uh, the support of the Egyptian government to the private sector to uh, maximize the role of the private sector in the Egyptian economy. Also, the, um, the transformation and the uh, digitalization 
um, and all the uh, issues of investment and how Egypt is trying to pave the way and to get rid of all the obstacles for all the investments and all the investors to, uh, to provide a very uh, friendly investment environment. Let's watch the report and come back. Prime Minister Mustafa Madbouli headed Tuesday to the Saudi capital of Riyadh to participate in the 8th edition of the Future Investment Initiative FII conference on behalf of President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. The conference, which is taking place from the 29th to the 31st of October, is themed Infinite Horizons, Investing Today, Shaping Tomorrow. It will feature global leaders and attract over 5,000 participants and 500 speakers. Participants include policymakers, executives, investors, and top experts in economic and developmental fields related to investment. The conference covers critical topics such as economic stability, equitable development, combating climate change, artificial intelligence, innovation, health, geopolitics, and other global concerns in over 200 sessions. The FII conference is being held under the patronage of King Salim. Man bin Abdul Aziz Al Saud, uh, the custodian of the two holy mosques. It brings together global leaders, entrepreneurs, political leaders, media, and decision makers in finance, AI, sustainability, energy, uh, geoeconomics, and space. According to its website, the conference witnesses discussions on how investment can catalyze a prosperous and sustainable future, pushing the boundaries of what is possible for humanity. This year's conference will challenge attendees to think beyond uh, conventional limits and explore investment opportunities that can bridge current challenges with future possibilities. Minister of Foreign Affairs Badr Ablati and several high-level officials are accompanying the Prime Minister. Welcome back, uh, dear viewers, and still watching uh, Africa Today and LTV International, of course, as we are on the heart of Africa. Of course, we are get to address the humanitarian crisis and the humanitarian catastrophe in Sudan as well, based on the uh, civil war over there a long time ago. The humanitarian crisis addressed the UN General Secretary, Antonio Guterres, and he said that this Humanitarian crisis is, and the um, dispute over there in Sudan is fueled by the Western um, powers and other uh, powers and it got to be stopped, to stop the violence over there and to save the humanity in Sudan. Let's watch the next report. United Nations chief said Monday that Sudan's warring military and paramilitary forces are escalating attacks with outside powers fueling the fire, which is intensifying the nightmare of hunger and disease for millions. Secretary General Antonio Guterres warned the UN Security Council that the 18 months war might ignite regional instability from the Sahel to the Horn of Africa to the Red Sea. In a grim report, Guterres said the Sudanese people are are living through numerous nightmares from killings and unspeakable atrocities uh, to fast spreading diseases, mass ethnic violence and 750,000 people facing catastrophic food insecurity and famine conditions in North Darfur displacement sites. He singled out uh, shocking reports of mass killings and violence in villages in East Central Gizira province in recent days. The UN and a doctor's group uh, said paramilitary fighters ran riot in the region in a multi-day attack that killed more than 120 people in one town. Sudan plunged into conflict in mid-April 2023 with long-simmering tensions between its military and paramilitary leaders broke out in the capital Khartoum and spread to other regions including western Darfur. The war has killed more than 24,000 people so far, according to armed conflict location and event data, a group monitoring the conflict since it started. It has created the world's worst displacement crisis, with more than 11 million people fleeing their homes, including 3 million to neighboring countries. Guetras urged both sides to immediately agree to a cessation of hostilities, ensure the protection of civilians for which they bear primary 
responsibility and enable humanitarian aid to flow to millions in need. The Secretary General said he is horrified by reports that the uh, Paramilitary Rapid Support Forces, or R RSF, continue to attack civilians in North Darfur's capital, El Fashar, and surrounding areas, including displacement sites where famine has been confirmed. Guetra said those who violate international humanitarian law must be held accountable. The war began four years after a pro-democracy uprising forced the military's ouster of Sudan's longtime dictator, Omar al-Bashir, which was followed by a short-lived transition to democracy. The war is really violating all the international humanitarian law just resulting in devastating consequences and terrible repercussions on the civilians. The civilians always paying the heavy bills for the wars and actually living the life unlivable, simply unlivable, unhuman. So we will, um, I mean, we, we just hope that the, uh, the situation in Sudan and the other in Gaza and Lebanon and everywhere in African continent and in the Middle East to, be, to come back to and to for all the civilians everywhere and all the people to enjoy peace and prosperity. So, and this was the end of our today's edition of Africa Today. Many thanks for watching. Goodbye.